It is a blessing to be in the house of the Lord today, isn't it? Um, I just want to thank all of you for coming out to be with us on this Father's Day uh, celebration today. Happy Father's Day to everyone out there today. I hope you enjoy it. I uh, hope you go home and, and have a good cookout. You know, that's the one day our, our families let, let the men cook out for their families is on Father's Day, you know. So, <laughs> but uh, no, we like to do things like that. But I uh, hope everyone has a blessed day. Let's go ahead and get, begin with a word of prayer. Let's please remember all of our prayer requests that are in the bulletin and all the unspoken prayer requests. And uh, as we go before the Lord and just pray for uh, the upcoming things, Bible school, uh, Thursday Night Live again coming up here in just a few weeks. Um, you know, just be praying for all all the outreach opportunities that we have in the church and be praying for our community. So let's begin with prayer and then we'll continue with our time of worship. Dear Lord, I thank you so much. I thank you for allowing us to be here today, for showing us just how blessed we are, Lord, by letting us come here freely. And Lord, I pray that we remember that each and every day, not just on Sundays, but every day, how free we are to be able to worship you and to be able to openly proclaim your name and the salvation that we have through you. I pray, Lord, that you help us uh, to live the lives you would have us to live, and I pray that we're all here of one mind and one accord today and ready to worship and study and just fellowship with one another and grow closer to you as well as to one another. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So good to see you in church this morning. If you notice the beautiful flowers up here, I was told they were given in honor of all the fathers today. So fathers, you've got something beautiful to look up here this morning and know how much you're appreciated. And we appreciate the flowers. If you would, please look in your hymnal on page 329, and we'll stand and sing all three verses of Grace Greater Than Our Sin. Please stand.
And if you will, turn over to 136, and we'll sing the first, second, and fourth verses of Are You Washed in the Blood? Thank you. You may be seated. We've got Bible school coming up this week. It starts on Tuesday. And after church today, anybody that signed up, we're going to have a very brief meeting and give you your t-shirts to wear throughout the week. But I just want to thank you guys. I said something this week I don't think I have ever said. Somebody asked me, they said, do you need any more help? And I said, we have enough help, but we'd love for you to come. And in all the years, I've been working in Bible school for over 20 years, I don't ever think I've said that. So I want to thank you guys so much for just reaching out to help and showing your love for Jesus. So let's bow our heads and ask God to bless us. Dear Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We praise you for all the dads out there. And we just praise you for this day. We praise you for giving us the opportunity to have Bible school. So now we ask you to send all the kids out that you can, Lord, that we can teach them more about you. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
will dismiss to uh, nursery and to children's church if there are any kids that want to take part in those today. And for everyone else, if you would turn your Bibles over to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 15. Uh, if you were here at Thursday Night Live, this is going to be a familiar passage. It's actually, we talked about this one Thursday night, but we're looking at it from a little bit different perspective today. But, um, you know, it is uh, Father's Day. The title of my sermon is, It's Easy to Become a Father, But It's Not So Easy uh, to Be a Good Dad. You know, and I think that's something we lose sight of today. We think becoming a father or a mother makes us an adult, you know, and a lot of people, they, they try to rush into it, and they're not ready for it, and there's a lot of people that really, you know, I, I, don't, I don't look down on anyone that decides not to have kids, you know, uh, I've had people in my family I think should have never had kids, but they did, and I think for the wrong reasons, not that they didn't love their kids, you know, but um, I just feel like they were not prepared, and they're still not prepared, um, but that's, that's neither here nor there. But I want us as fathers and mothers as well, this could be a message for mothers as well, but this is especially geared toward fathers. I want us to realize that yes, we're all, you know, those of us that have children, we're fathers, but are we a good dad? Are we someone that our kids will look up to? Are we someone our kids will emulate? Or are we someone that our kids have learned the life lessons that they need to learn? Are we that person that is teaching them? So let's look at Luke chapter 15, starting at verse 11. The word of the Lord says, He also said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had, and he traveled to a distant country, where he squandered his estate in foolish living. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food, and here I am dying of hunger? I'll get up, go to my father, and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. So he got up and went to his father, but while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and threw his arms around his neck and he kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his servants, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fatted calf and slaughter it and let's celebrate with a feast. Because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I thank you today. <clears throat> I thank you so much for the, the many stories that you've given us uh, from the history of your people. And Lord, I pray that we can use these stories. We use this, this word that we call the Bible. And I pray, Lord, that we can use this to grow closer to you. We use these passages to, to understand you just a little better that we grow closer to one another through this study, and that we can go out and be a light to this world and show them your love through our actions and our words. Just help us with this today. Watch over us, lead us, and guide us in everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> now this, this passage, <coughs> excuse me, this passage, you know, uh, of the prodigal son, it's, it's a very, you know, most people know it. Even people that aren't in church have heard the story. They may not know the name of it, but they've heard this story and, you know, and there's three different perspectives on it, and I've preached on every, every angle I feel like I can out of this passage uh, over time. You know, there, there's a lot of different messages in this. But we want to look at the main characters here today, which is the father and the son, the prodigal son. You know, and we see a relationship here, and this is all we know of these people. Some want to say it's a parable. Some want to say it's true. Uh, we really don't have any proof either way. I, I lean toward it's more of a parable than, than an actual story, but that's irrelevant. What it is is irrelevant. <clears throat> it is something that, that the Lord used as an example in how to live and, and the way forgiveness works. 
You know, and when we look at this story, we see the perspective of the prodigal son, of course, and all the things that he did. You know, he squandered everything he had. He moved off. He done all the wrong things like most kids do today. How many, how many here did not do something wrong when they first become an adult? I put that in air quotes because many of us still aren't adults yet. But, uh, but you know, we, we, we feel like we have all the answers. We know everything. So we rush out and we do what we want to do, and then we realize we've messed up. So we can... We can kind of look at the prodigal son and say, yes, I am like him. But also we need to look at the father. And some of the things here, and there's a lot of lessons in this passage about fathers today. And this is really what I want to look at. There's a lot of mistakes this father makes, and there's a lot of things that this father does right. And we're going to look at uh, some of both of those today. Not everything, because we would be here a while. But I promise you, I'm going to keep it short, and I'm going to let you get home and, and enjoy your day with your family. So one of the first things I want us to realize from this passage is that fathers should be providers. Now that's something that in today's society, today's culture, maybe it's changing a little bit now with, uh, with uh, you know, Gen Z coming up, the, the mindset of, of these traditional roles in the family is changing. But, you know, fathers today pretty much are constantly reminded, whether you're in church or out of church, that it's your job to provide for your family. That's how we were raised. You know, my dad instilled that in me, and I hope I instilled that in my sons. You know, that it's our job to provide. You know, it's a mother's job to nurture and to care for and to love. The dad provides. You know, and while some are happy, some love that setup. You know, you go to work every week, you bring home the paycheck, you put it in the bank, and you're good. You can sit around and watch football all weekend. You can cut grass. You can stay outside away from all the drama and let mom take care of all that. There are a lot of dads like that setup. That's okay if you do. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's some that don't want it that way. There's some dads that are jealous of the moms because they look at it and say, well, I have to go to work all week while she stays at home and does nothing. A lot of men have that attitude of their wives and their mothers. They think they don't do anything, and, and they get jealous, and they don't want to work, so they wind up quitting, and no one's provided for, no one's caring for anyone because of all the anger and the animosity built up between mom and dad because dad won't work and mom won't work, and you know everything is just boiling over, over this jealousy. And the problem with that is mothers and fathers alike want to be their kid's friend today, their best friend. Now, don't get me wrong, I love to talk with my kids, I love to have conversations with them, but they have friends, they need a dad. You know, they need someone that they can go to when they have problems. They need someone that may have an answer for them. Maybe I've lived through the same experience and I, I can help them through it. Maybe you've lived through some experiences your kids are, are now living through and you can help them with that. We need to be parents instead of friends. And the passage we're looking at kind of goes into to this perspective. You know, it talks about being a parent and a friend, and it shows us how damaging this can be to our kids. Look at this, the first couple of verses of our opening passage. It says, he also said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Now listen to this, you know, in this day and age, you know, if you, just to give you a little bit of background on this, in this day and age, when a father in a family died, the belongings were divided between the sons. There was no will, you know, they, they really didn't set things how they wanted them. It was pretty much set in stone how Jewish families divided up their wealth, what little bit or however much they had, they would divide up. That's over in Deuteronomy chapter 21. It kind of sets it in stone how it's divided. Deuteronomy 21.15 says, If a man has two wives, one loved and the other neglected, and both the loved and the neglected bear him sons, and if the neglected wife has the firstborn son, when that man gives what he has to his sons as an inheritance, he is not to show favoritism to the son of the loved wife as his firstborn over the firstborn of the neglected wife. He must acknowledge the firstborn, the son of the neglected wife, by giving him two shares of his estate. For he is the first fruits of his virility. He has the rights of the firstborn. Now it's talking about something very specific right there. It's talking about uh, polygamy, you know, for, you know, just to be honest with you. It's talking about a man with two wives. But whether he has two wives or ten wives or one wife, the firstborn son has the rights of that firstborn son because he is the first fruits of that father. And because of that, he gets two shares of the estate. So now, when you have two sons... And you've got to split it up that way. You've got to divide your inheritance into thirds, don't you? So the older son would get two-thirds of the estate, and the younger son would get one-third of the estate. He would get two parts, and the younger son would get one. So we have it pretty much 
set in stone. And we can assume that this is a Jewish family because of who's giving, telling the story and because of it being the word of God and some of the other things in this story that really wouldn't be significant unless they were Jewish. So we can assume this is a Jewish family. So where did this younger son's attitude come from? You know, where, where did his mindset come from that he should get what he wants right now? Everything should be now. It should be instantaneous. I joke about that all the time. I, I love to use the Internet as an example. When we first got the Internet, I was amazed at that little sound that it would make when it was trying to connect over the phone line. You get to be on the Internet for two minutes, and then you were kicked off because somebody tried to call the house. Now, today, if the power flickers and the... And the uh, uh, the, the, the Wi-Fi box, I don't know what it's called, <laughs> when, it, when it has to reset, you know, we're angry because we have to wait five minutes to watch the show we were watching or, or to get on Facebook and post about being offline. You know, we, we get aggravated over two or three minutes of being held up. And, and he had the same attitude. He was wanting what he had, what he had coming to him now. And you might say, well, how does it, why does he deserve what he has? Because it's set in stone that he gets that. He knew that he was entitled to that as the younger son, and he wanted it. But the problem was where that mindset came from was this father, just like a lot of fathers today, wanted to be his son's friend. He wanted to be his pal, his buddy. You know, he thought his job was to provide a means to be taken care of while the mothers provided that love and that nurturing. It was his job to be their friend. It was his job to be the head of the household. So when the younger son came and said, Dad, I want what's coming to me. Go ahead and give me my inheritance now. What was a friend to do? It's harder to tell a friend, though, than it is a parent or a child, isn't it? So when, the, when he comes and asks his dad, his dad's like, well, if I tell him no, he's going to be mad at me. If I tell him no, it may hurt the relationship, so I'm just going to give in. I'm going to give him what he wants. I'm not going to teach a lesson. I'm not going to show him why it's important for him to wait. I'm just going to give him what he wants to keep him happy. And this goes to the second thought that I get in this passage is fathers should teach and train their children. We should take every opportunity we have to teach our children. And the fatherly thing to do in this situation would have been to teach his child before the time came. Don't wait until that moment when he comes up and says, Dad, I want my inheritance. Go ahead and give it to me. He should have been training his child long before this moment. Deuteronomy 6-7 says, Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you, or when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Now, of course, that passage is talking about the statutes of God, the godly ways of living. You know, he's, it's, it's basically saying, repeat these to your children over and over and over. And it's not just repetition from the mouth, but it's repetition from the action as well, showing your kids what it means to live for God. Now, if this man had been living that exemplary life, would his child have made this decision? I'm not saying he would or wouldn't have. It may have changed his mindset. It may not have. A lot of parents do everything they possibly can to provide for their children and be a good example, and the kids still make their own choices. It's called free will. But the one thing we've got to remember is the more we teach them the proper way, the more likely they are to choose the proper way. We've got to train our kids and show them what is important and what should be important. But what did this father do with this request? He said, Dad, give me what, what's coming to me. I know you're not dead yet. But it's coming. <laughs> Go ahead and give it to me. And what did dad do? Did he say, well, son, I don't think that's a good idea. No, he gave in. He gave in. Too many dads today fall in this trap. We feel like it's our, our duty to give our children everything they ask for. We feel like uh, you know, we have to get them you know, the newest video game system or, or the coolest clothes, the most expensive shoes. We have to get them, when they turn 16, we have to get them that really nice car so they, they're the envy of all their friends. We have to pay to put them on every travel team they want to play on, whether it's basketball, baseball, football, uh, soccer, volleyball, tennis, whatever it is, we're going to pay for it. We're going to put our kids out there because they're going to be the next Michael Jordan or they're going to be the next Tiger Woods or they're going to be the next whoever. As long as we pay enough money and we, we let them do the things they want, they're going to like us. Even if they don't succeed in life, they're going to like us. That's all that matters. That's, that's the mindset of a lot of dads today. I want my kid to be the most envied, the most looked up to. I want to be the cool dad that everybody wants to hang out with. We've got to get away from that. Fathers, today we need to stand up 
And we need to teach and train our kids instead of worrying about being their best friend. Verse 6, Proverbs 22, 6 says this. Start a youth out on his way. Even when he grows old, he will not depart from it. Now, what gives us an idea that this son had not been taught properly or been trained the right way fully? I'm not saying none at all. I'm not saying the father was a terrible father, but he obviously had missed some lessons here and there. Read the next few verses, starting at verse 13 in our opening passage. It says, not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his, his estate in foolish living. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. Now you might think, what's the big deal? He's feeding some hogs. What's the big deal about that? Well, in Jewish culture, pigs are something that are so unclean that it's, it's literally against the law for pigs to even touch the ground in Israel, much less have a Jewish person touch one or feed one. And here was a young man that went into another country, and there he is. He, he had lost everything in, in riotous living. You know, it says foolish living right here, depending on the translation you, you're using. But, you know, he, he's out there living foolishly. He's probably spending money on women and on gambling and on partying, you know, getting the buying rounds for all of his friends at the bar or whatever it may be. And all of a sudden, the famine comes, and he's lost everything. He has nothing. And he goes to work for a guy, and the guy sends him out to feed his pigs. Now, under normal circumstances, that would have been one of the most insulting things you could ever offer a Jewish person. But he took the job. And verse 16 says, he longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating. Now, you might, you might say, well, well, how does that show anything about the father? Well, the son had not been shown the importance of the covenant that he had with God. If he had been shown this covenant, if he had been taught about this covenant, he would have understood why that was a job that no Jewish person would ever take. If he had been taught by the father, he would have had more honor than to go squander his money. We, we, have, uh, we have evidence that he had no desire to live a moral life because he lost everything on that foolish living. Now, this doesn't mean the father didn't live a holy life. This doesn't mean there wasn't, they were not a religious family. But somewhere along the way, he had failed to instill in his son the importance of that religious life. Now, parents, are we instilling in our children today the importance of a religious life? Every time we allow them to miss church for practice, every time we travel with the team because they're going to be the next star, they're going to be the next big star, even though they have one in a five million chance of making any professional sport they're living in any capacity, not just as an athlete, but whether it's as an executive or a, or a scout or a coach, there's like a one in five million chance of a, of a child making it into professional sports, even, though with, even with all the professional sports we have today. But we encourage those dreams because we don't want to squander, we don't want to squash our kids' dreams, we don't want to crush their, their will and their soul, but we're willing to keep that built up while we're willing to sell out their soul to Satan because we're saying this is more important than God. When we teach our kids by letting them have their way, we're teaching them that God is not that important. God's okay when nothing else is going on. God's okay when you're in town and you're, you, you, know, you woke up, you're not sleeping in. God is okay when it doesn't interfere with sports. God is okay when he doesn't interfere with, with vacation. God is okay when he doesn't interfere with work. But all that other stuff takes precedence. I know a lot of you are probably sitting here thinking this morning, well, I don't feel that way. We've all felt that way at some time. There's always something else a little more important than God. And that's where we fail as parents. Now, it seems like I'm p painting a pretty bleak picture of this father. You know, like he didn't do anything right. And that, that's not true. He did some things right. And, and we're going to look at those here in just a minute. But I want you to think about that, though. Think about the things that this father did. He wasn't a terrible father, obviously. He was successful. He made money. You know, he made enough money he could give an inheritance to his family. But what was the number one priority in the father's life? He had made that the number one priority in his son's life as well. 
The son wasn't asking to go to the temple to offer sacrifice. The son wasn't asking to be taught how to pray. The son said, give me my money. So that kind of lets you know what the father had instilled in him. But there were some positives too. The next thing we need to remember is father, not just mothers, but fathers should also nurture their children. Starting in verse 17 of the opening passage, it says, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food, and here I am dying of hunger? I'll get up, go to my father, and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. So he got up and went to his father, but while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and threw his arms around his neck and he kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his servants, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fatted calf and slaughter it. Let's celebrate with a feast. Because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. We see right here the father did some things right. He provided for his family like we're supposed to. He, you know, he made a way for them to be able to celebrate when the son returned. He made a way to, to be able to give an inheritance to his children. But he also nurtured his children in a way that they knew there was help when they needed it. If this father had been a terrible father, do you think that son would have ever thought, I can go back home and dad will take me? I can go back home and mom will be there to love me? So we know the father did something right. He instilled a love in these kids and let them know he loved them regardless of the choices that they've made. Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Listen to that. It doesn't say provide. It doesn't say you give money and get out of the way. It doesn't say let the moms take care of everything. It says don't stir up anger and bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Guys, we need to nurture our kids more today. We need to be there for our kids more today. We need to show them it's okay to cry. We need to show them it's okay to love and to say I love you. We need, we need to let them know that a closer relationship with God is not just something to talk about, but it's something to strive for. We need to do this today. And the father obviously had done just that at some point. Because it says when the son returned to his senses, when he came back to his senses and realized what he had done, he went back home. He knew dad was there to help him pick up the pieces. Now, does that mean the son's going to get another inheritance? I'm not going to read the rest of that passage, but if you get down on in there, you see, no, the dad tells the other son, he's like, everything I have is yours. He's already gotten his inheritance. What's left is yours. So the, he's not giving the son any more money, but he is going to give him love. He's going to give him compassion, and he's going to help teach him what he needs to do to survive in this world. Fathers also need to love their children. Nurture and love kind of go hand in hand, but I felt like these two needed to be separated because not only did he nurture him, not only did he show him you know, that he could always come home if things went bad or he always had a family that he could turn to, but he truly loved him. Look at how he responded. It says, when the son was still afar off, the father saw him, he ran out, threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. We, that, that, that's a sign of love, guys. That, that's something that men struggle to do today. They don't want to show their love, or they don't want to show it in the wrong way. We've got to uphold a reputation in our community. You know, we can't let people see that we care about something to the point that we would cry or that we would kiss our son or daughter or that we would hug them, tell them we love them. We've got, we've got to be stoic. We've got to be tough. We've got to hold, uphold that image. Guys, let me tell you something. The best way we can show our kids that we love them is not hugging them. It's not kissing them. It's not even telling them we love them. It's not being gone all the time. It's not being at work 60 to 80 hours a week. It's not every day you get off, you, you're, you know, you're packing everything in the car and taking them to travel ball, and then them being out on the field all day where you sit in the stands and talk to the parents. That's not showing love. Showing love is being there. 
on Saturday morning, which I don't, kids don't watch cartoons on Saturday morning anymore. When I grew up, you had Saturday morning was cartoon day. Does anybody else here remember that? You get up at 7 o'clock in the morning. You, you wouldn't get up till 10 all week long. And then on Saturday, you was up at 7 o'clock in the morning watching cartoons till noon. You know, let dad sit there with you and watch cartoons. You may not like the cartoon, guys, but then you may watch it and say, that's pretty good, you know? There's a lot of cartoons I fell in love with growing up with the kids, SpongeBob and, you know, Cat Dog and all these weird cartoons that they would watch. I uh, love those cartoons. And I never would have gotten into them if I didn't take time to sit with my kids and watch them. But, you know, just be there for your kids. Take them outside, throw a ball with them. You know, if you're, if, if you're in the dirt bikes and four-wheelers and stuff, get on there and ride with them. Don't just teach them how to do it and then tell them to go have fun. Get out there with them. Spend time with your family, not just around your family. That's one of the most important things that you can do to show your kids that you love them. Deuteronomy chapter 31 at verse 12 says, Gather the people, men, women, dependents, and the resident aliens within your city gates so that they may listen and learn to fear the Lord your God and be careful to follow all the words of this law. Then their children who do not know the law will listen and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. Be there for them. Gather them together. Let them see the life you live and explain the life you live to them. Help your children become the adults they were created to be. You know, there's a fine line between letting your kids be kids too long and trying to make them adults too quickly. I see parents putting their little girls in prom dresses at 10 years old because, well, the fifth grade's having a prom now. I, I see parents that have a, I have a cousin who lives at home. He's 47 years old and still lives at home with mom and dad. It goes both ways. Guys, we've got to let our kids be kids as long as possible, but at the same time, we have to teach them, that, you know, there comes a point when you have to be an adult. And the only way they're going to learn that is if we teach them those lessons. And this last thing, I'm already almost finished, guys. This last thing that, that I think fathers need to do is one of the hardest ones, especially in today's society. But it's something that we can't look at society and say, well, this is what... Culture is teaching us. This is what the government tells us. This is what, you know, everybody else says. This is something, this is what God says, and we need to remember that. But fathers, today more than ever, we need to correct our children. One of the hardest things to do as a father, I can remember coming home after work. I'd, I worked second shift when the kids, when the boys were young, and I would come home and Michelle would say, you need to whip Zach. It never was Blake. It was always Zach. He was the mean one. He would, he would, put toys down the toilet and you'd have to take the whole thing off the floor just to get it out of the I don't know how he would get them in there he would eat soap you know I mean, he, would, he would do all these things he'd paint on the walls it was always that you need to whip Zach and I, I, I mean I didn't see what he did so imagine just coming home from work after working 10 or 12 hours and you need to whip Zach I'm going to have to wake him up out of bed and whip him she goes, is that what you want yes that's what I want I'll do it in the morning just don't have it in me. Dads, can you relate? You know, I mean, it happens. And, we, and Michelle and I would argue because I didn't want to correct my son. I wanted him to be my friend. And if I was the bad guy, I was the one whipping him. Michelle had to experience it, but I was the one that had to punish him. I was the bad guy. But later on, I realized God is using this to help me show him what it means to be a man. And as he got older, it didn't take whippings anymore. All it took was a threat of a whipping because I gave him a few good whippings and he knew what it was. So when he would get in a restaurant or something and act up, I'd just get in his ear and say, remember what I did last week. <laughs> and he would straighten up really quick. And that's all it took. You know, we need to correct our children. It's not just about instruction. It's not just about love. You know, too many kids today have never truly been corrected. You know, today we tell our kids, I remember when I was growing up, uh, one of the things my mom would do, go to your room. You know, in my day, yeah, I had a TV in my room. It was a little 13-inch black and white TV. You know, it wasn't much, but I had one. But kids today, they have video games, they have TVs, they have their computers. Their, their entire social life is right there on their phone or their computer. So really, what punishment are you giving your kids? And people say, well, I can't take my phone, the phone away from them. That's just cruel. I mean, think about it. The reason it's so cruel is because you've taught them that's all they need in life is their phone. 
Let's show our kids what it means to live by correction and by love. Proverbs 22.15 says, This is foolishness is bound to the heart of a youth. A rod of discipline will separate it from him. Remember that. Right here in Proverbs 23.13, it says, Don't withhold discipline from a youth. If you punish him with a rod, he will not die. Punish him with a rod and you will rescue him from Sheol. And then over in Proverbs 13, 24, it says, The one who will not use the rod hates his son, but the one who loves him disciplines him diligently. Now, of course, they're talking about using a rod. I don't know what, what they're describing. Right I'm not saying go out and get a stick and beat your kids with it, guys. I'm not saying use your fists. That's a step too far. I'm not saying use your open hand and smack them across the face. That is a step too far. But we can discipline our kids today in a way that makes them understand right from wrong. There are ways that we can do this without abusing our kids. You know, a lot of people say, well, I got that when I was growing up. There's nothing wrong with it. And you know what? You're right. I got whipped with a belt when I was growing up. I, don't, I never used a belt on my kids. Not because I felt like it was abusive, but I felt like there were better ways to, to, to train those kids, to discipline those kids. I would take things away from them, and I whipped them. I used my hand, but I would whip them. You know, I can remember growing up, my mom, I don't see too many willow trees around here, the weeping willows. I remember she'd go out and get one of those limbs off a willow tree and, and smack me across the legs. And when I knew I was getting a whip, and I always put a pair of jeans on, had a coat on, you know, it hung down past my butt and, and made sure it, it wasn't going to be too bad. Every now and then she'd catch me with a pair of shorts on, and she'd wear me out. But you know what? I've never done those things again. I'm not saying we should do that, but guys, we have to learn to discipline our kids. As fathers, we have to be that disciplinary, and we have to be the warden from time to time. We need to learn the role of a parent and a child rather than a friend and, and your child. We've got to understand that, yes, we have to be there for our, for our kids. We want to be their friend, but we also have to teach them. We have to love them. We have to nurture them. We have to teach and train them, and then we also have to correct them. You know, when your kids don't want to come to church, by forcing them to come, by whipping them and then making them come, all you're doing is instilling in them that they hate church. You need to show them why church is important. And the only way you can show them that is by coming yourself. The only way you can show them that God is the most important thing in your life is by living as if God is the most important thing in your life, not everything else, and then God when it's convenient. Guys, like I said, I'm, I'm as guilty of these things as anybody else, but there comes a time when we have to realize, and it's never too late. I don't care how old your kids are. It's never too late to begin being that good example. It's never too late. I know being a dad sometimes can be a, a selfless act. You know, a lot of times you know, we, we joke about dads, and a lot of it's true, you know. Moms will go out and do the laundry and do dishes and cook dinner and make sure all the kids are bathed and the house is clean, you know, and they do all of that every day. Dad goes and does a load of laundry and he wants praise for a week for it. You know, we're, we're guilty of that, guys. Or we might clean a couple of dishes after, you know, a, few, a couple of us eat. Everybody's gone but mom and dad and, and dad does the dishes that night when there's two plates and two cups and a couple of forks to clean. And he wants praise for a month. We're guilty of that. But you know what? Being a dad a lot of times is a selfless job. We are expected to provide. That is our number one job in the eyes of society, in the eyes of culture today, is our job is to provide. Men are put on the back burner today in today's society. Guys, I'm saying don't get discouraged by that and don't be sucked in to the idea that society is creative, what a, an ideal family is. God gives us what an ideal family is. The mothers have a role the fathers have a role, and we have to fulfill those. But there are things that we do together, and we've got to learn how to do those things together. So as, as Randy gets ready to play a verse of a song here in just a second, I want you to think about that. I want you to think about your relationship with your kids. You know, how good or how bad is it? I, I don't know. That's between you and them. But, you know, have you really set that standard? Have you really lived that example for your kids the way you know you should? 
If not, why not come and say, Lord, help me to be that example. Help me to be that light in my kids' lives. Help, help them to see you through me. Help them to see the importance of being a good dad or a good mom. Help them see the importance of not just being a friend or being a provider, but being a teacher, being, a, uh, being uh, you know, someone that loves them, being a corrections officer. Help them to see the importance of these things. You know, of course, this altar is always open. If you want to come forward and pray, I'll pray with you. But if not, pray at your seat and say, Lord, help me to be the father you've made me to be. Help me to be the father that my kids deserve, not the, not the father I want them to have. Help me to be that example. Help me to be the one that they turn to when they need help. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I thank you today for each and every one that has come out. And Lord, I pray on this Father's Day that all the dads around this country and around the world, I pray that we realize the importance of the job you've given us. It's not just the physical act of making children that makes us a dad. But it's actually living that life every day. It's, it's being that example. It's showing our kids the importance of a relationship with you. Help us to do that today, dear Lord. Watch over us. Lead us and guide us in everything. And just help us to be the fathers and the mothers that you've made us to be. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a few announcements before we dismiss. Uh, there is no youth group tonight. It's Father's Day. We're going to let everybody stay at home today and enjoy that evening together. Uh, of course, Bible school starts Tuesday. It goes Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And then Friday is the celebration, uh, family celebration. Uh, so I invite all of you to come. If you have ki if you get kids in your community or in your family uh, that would like to come, we'd love to have them. Uh, it starts Tuesday night at 6.30 to 8.30 each night. And then also, um, seems like there's something I'm forgetting, choir practice Tuesday night uh, right here in the choir room at 7 o'clock. I'm sure Randy would love to have you. And also, we are running the bus. You know, if you, if you need a ride or know someone that needs a ride, please let us know, and uh, we'll, we'll get those arrangements worked out. And I don't know why I feel like I'm forgetting something. Oh, the meeting. Right after church, if you signed up to help in Bible school, please hang around. It won't, it'll only take about five to ten minutes, maybe not even that long. Please just come forward and kind of hang out up here, and, and as things thin out, we'll, Michelle will have the meeting finished up. Yes. Oh, yes, thank you. There was something else. Thank you. Okay. We do have a gift for all the men in the church that are here today uh, at each door. I think they're at all four, well, all four doors. Uh, uh, it's a pen, I believe, but if, you, if you'd like to have one, uh, please go by and get one. Uh, we'd love to, for you to take one home with you uh, in honor of Father's Day. I do uh, want to wish you a happy Father's Day. You know, don't burn your house down with your grills today, you know. Uh, I say that from experience. I almost did it once. So, <laughs> I mean, but, uh, but guys, have a blessed day and go out and be a light to the world.